Niger in crisis two weeks after a military coup. The generals in control ignoring international demands to reinstate President Mohamed Bazoum. So what's the future for the vast country and key Western ally? What could follow after Niger's political upheaval? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Niger's new military rulers are in a standoff with the West and some of their neighbours, refusing to hand back power to the man they ousted. The country's borders are closed, but President Mohamed Bazoum has been in contact with the outside world, speaking to US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, among others. Changed times from only a few months ago, when Blinken dropped by to visit Niger, seen as an important US ally in West Africa, but one whose allegiance is now uncertain. France has retained a military force in its former colony, but tens of thousands of supporters of the coup leaders rallied in the capital to protest against the French presence. They want foreign troops gone and accuse France of exploiting Niger's wealth of natural resources. We'll assess the implications of the crisis with our guests in just a few moments. But first, let's talk to our correspondent in neighbouring Nigeria, Ahmed Idris. Ahmed, how much support does this coup have within Niger and outside the country? Adrian, going by the demonstrations we saw uh, over the past few days or two weeks since the coup, uh, we'll say it's significant. But it's hard to compare with the support Bazoum has uh, or the government of uh, President Mohamed Bazoum has. Because remember, this is a man who was elected by majority votes into office. And of course, there are also to be considered the civil society who condemned the military coup in Niger. So we can say the military uh, leaders have significant support uh, from a certain part of the population, especially in the capital Niamey, which has been an opposition stronghold. So what are the implications of this coup, Ahmed? The implications are many. First of all, to the country itself. Since the coup, we've seen uh, external donors, uh, partners of Niger, helping in terms of food supplies, education, healthcare, delivery, water supply, and even agriculture, uh, signifying the interest to cut aid. And that has happened, and we'll continue to see such happening in the future. Now, with their neighbors, trade has been closed. Borders have been closed, and trade has been cut off with Niger, especially in, with Nigeria. We've seen electricity supplies from Nigeria, which supplies most of the electricity Niger enjoys, has been cut off, and so is economic and trade uh, links. This is having a significant effect on the local population, on the local economy. Uh, what we see right now is that uh, no more business transactions happening across the, two, the borders of the two countries. Uh, hundreds of people on a normal day will cross over into Nigerian territory to stock up on supplies and go back to Niger. And But since the announcement of sanctions against Niger by the economic community of West African states, we've seen a slowdown or a complete shutdown of the border. So no trade is happening. And apart from that, that also will put a lot of pressure on the local economy. We've seen inflation going through the roof. What, what are the chances of, it, of uh, regional military intervention against the coup leaders? Well, more and more, we see the authorities in uh, Niamey uh, digging in. Uh, they don't have any intention of handing over power. We've seen uh, from the early days of uncertainty, they have now established what seems like a government that they want to continue running on. Uh, we've seen them appoint governors for the various regions, appointing mayors, ministers to help the government run its business. And then recently, we've seen them appoint a prime minister. So that shows you that they are digging in for a long time. And experts or analysts believe that as long as this is allowed to continue, it will be difficult to negotiate a return to democracy uh, in Niger. This is what we're seeing or what we saw in countries like Mali and Burkina Faso. It all started like this. And then suddenly, we are in for a long wait for democracy to return to those countries. So so the threat of military force is still there, according to ECOWAS. But again, the appetite for immediate deployment of forces is not there. What we can see is that, yes, the threat of force is still on the table, but we don't know how soon they want to do that. Al Jazeera's Ahmed Idris reporting from Abuja. Many thanks indeed, Ahmed.
The region is, of course, no stranger to military coups, which have toppled several governments in recent years. Niger is just the latest. Two weeks ago, Mohamed Bazoum was detained by members of his presidential guard. In August 2020, Mali's army ousted President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita after mass anti-government protests. An interim civilian government was appointed, but then forced out, and today Mali remains under military rule. In September 2021, soldiers in neighboring Guinea overthrew President Alpha Conde. That followed a disputed election and his campaign for a third term. Last year, in Burkina Faso, there was not one but two coups within months of each other. Army Captain Ibrahim Traore remains in control there. Also last year, 11 people were killed during a failed coup in Guinea-Bissau. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Abuja, we're joined by Idayat Hassan, director of the Center for Democracy and Development, a policy and research organization focusing on democracy and development in West Africa. From London, we're joined by Alexis Akwajiram, who is the managing editor at news site Semaphore Africa. And from Washington, D.C., Cameron Hudson, senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. A warm welcome to you all. Cameron, let's start with you. How rapidly is the window to solve the crisis in Niger diplomatically closing? It's probably already closed. Uh, my sense from the events of the last just 24 hours uh, by the junta in Niger, appointing a civilian prime minister, appointing uh, a civilian cabinet uh, to help administer affairs of state, I suspect that very quickly uh, they're going to announce an 18-month or 24-month uh, transition to doing elections. Um, they have been avoiding negotiating with American officials, with, with regional officials from ECOWAS, because they want to present the world with a fait accompli. They don't want to negotiate uh, with the international community the terms of a restoration of either President Bazoum or democracy in the country. They want to present us with their terms for how the country will be administered and leave it open to us to try to negotiate or walk back uh, what has already happened. So I think the quicker that Washington and others acknowledge the, the facts on the ground, I think the more progress we can, be, can get made in trying to talk to these coup leaders, because right now there's absolutely no progress being made in trying to engage them. Alexis, would you agree with that? And will ECOWAS intervene militarily, do you think? I mean, it has a pretty shaky history when it comes to restoring order in countries embroiled in conflict. Um, what are the risks of military intervention in Niger? I mean, first of all, I agree with everything Cameron said. I think the window ultimately is closing rapidly if it hasn't closed completely. Um, I think in terms of ECOWAS intervening, I don't think they will intervene militarily. Um, they've said repeatedly that is the last resort. I think, if anything, they were probably hasty in uh, offering that as a solution at some stage. Um, the risk now for them is that they're going to be in a situation, or they are in a situation, whereby their bark is being perceived as far worse than its bite. Um, and they're going to be looking for some kind of diplomatic solution, some way in which they can walk back from just putting that threat on the table. So they'll want to do that. I don't know how they're going to manage to do that, but it's going to be tricky. Um, this is all going to come up, presumably, when they meet tomorrow in Abuja to discuss the way forward. It would be very tricky to try and pull off some kind of military intervention, simply because, well, first of all, even before we get to the logistics, the thing to bear in mind is these heads of state in ECOWAS need the buy-in of their own people. Specifically, Nigeria does, uh, being the largest force and the biggest kind of pot of money behind ECOWAS. Now, already we've seen that the Nigerian Senate, the lawmakers, have said that they do not give this their backing. So even before you look at the terrain, the vast size of Niger, and how this would happen on the ground, you still need to get past the political barrier. Once you get past that, I don't think there really is an appetite for this. It would be very unpopular domestically for a number of these countries. And then they would be trying to install um, a president who is no longer particularly popular, because clearly there's a groundswell of support for what the junta has done. So, I mean, I think it would be very tricky. OK. Um, uh, Edea, do you agree with, with what you've just heard? I mean, how can this be solved diplomatically? I mean, is this an internal dispute between Nigerian elite. Um, is there actually broad popular support for what they've done? 
I think there is actually nothing like a good coup, uh, even though this coup is actually being sold to us as if it is a good coup. That uh, a push is a push and it cannot be corrected either by popular support. And of late, we also are aware of the fact that popular supports are engineered, they are bots, they are bots, uh, mobs or uh, protests are supported, people are mobilized to come in support of the junta, while some might actually come uh, on their own. But I think there are a mixture of things that are actually responsible for the coup data. The perennial identity issues that plagues uh, Africa out here, and of course, the uh, weaponization of anti-Western feelings have also come up very strongly to make some to support uh, the coup data. But we are here where we are, but diplomacy will remain the best way out of this uh, impasse. Cameron, Niger plays an important role in the U.S.'s counter-terrorism operations in the region. Um, why isn't the U.S. declaring what's happened in Niger a coup? Well, it hasn't because it wants to keep its options open. As soon as uh, the State Department declares that it has been a, a coup in, in the country, uh, there requires an automatic suspension of the kind of military assistance, uh, both intelligence provision, but also the training and equipping that we're doing with counterterrorism units in the country. Um, that gets suspended uh, virtually immediately. And so uh, I think Washington wants to try to preserve that for as long as it can. Um, and again, it is it is sticking to this notion that uh, that the window for diplomacy remains open. They're holding out hope that they can somehow reverse this and go back to a, a status quo ante of two weeks ago. Um, but I think as the days go on, uh, that reality looks like it's uh, less and less likely, and they're going to be faced uh, with a choice as to whether or not they declare this a coup, and then they're going to have to be faced with another choice, which is whether or not, despite the coup, they continue to maintain counterterrorism cooperation uh, with the military junta. Um, and again, I think this will be uh, a set of hard choices that Washington has to make. Um, it espouses democratic principles in these countries, um, but it also has hard security interests that it wants to pursue. And so how it balances those two kind of competing priorities in a case like Niger is something that Washington hasn't wanted to, to have to decide on. And that's why it is, uh, you know, holding holding fast to this idea that it is, it is a military takeover, but it is not a coup. You, you talk about these, these, these hard uh, strategic uh, priorities that exist in, in Niger for the U.S., though, Cameron. I mean, how determined... Is the U.S. to stay in Niger? How important is it? What, what is it that, that, that the U.S. is doing in Niger? Could you foresee a situation where I mean, the U.S. would ever get involved militarily? No, I can't see a situation where the U.S. is going to be involved militarily. Let's remember that in 2017, four U.S. Uh, servicemen were killed in Niger conducting counterterrorism operations on their own. Uh, ever since that moment, Washington has taken a big step back in terms of being on the front lines of this counterterrorism fight. Uh, they are providing train and equip and assistance uh, through intelligence support uh, to the Nigerian military and to other militaries in the region. Uh, but they are no longer on the front lines of a counterterrorism battle. I think that. That's deeply unpopular uh, and misunderstood, frankly, by the American public. And I don't see that as a step that Washington is going to be willing to take um, if it loses its partnership with, with the Nigerian military. Alexis, uh, acting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Nuland traveled to Niger on Monday to speak with coup leaders. She described their talks as extremely frank and at times quite difficult. Uh, what are the coup leaders' options right now? They've rejected attempts to mediate a way out of this crisis. How much room for maneuver do they have? What is their strategy moving forward, do you think? They could continue the same strategy that they've employed, which is essentially to say nothing and to not deal with um, those who are trying to seek negotiations, because ultimately the ball is in ECOWAS's court. Um, they probably made the calculation that the West particularly the U.S. and France, do not want to be seen to get involved because so much of this has been stoked by anti-Western sentiments. So then, as well as that, ECOWAS were the ones who put it on the table that military uh, intervention would be an option. So, therefore, it actually plays into the, the junta's best interest to say nothing to those who are trying to negotiate with them and rather to talk to those who might be allies in some way, shape or form, be they Burkina Faso, 
Mali, or even the Russians. So, I mean, I imagine that's probably what they're looking to do. In terms of other options, I think Cameron alluded to this earlier, what they can do is say, look, if people want some form of democratic transition, then we will set the terms, we will dictate how that happens, we will not be dictated to. So in order to do that, all they have to do is to make appointments, which we've seen them doing, and then present a, a final response, which is, you can have your transition, this is how it's going to play out, and then that way, they get what they want, but they get what they want on their own terms. Dad, how dangerous a moment is this for the, the, the wider region? If there was any kind of military intervention in Niger, how would that play out, play out in, in, in neighbouring countries? Do you think that there will ultimately be a, a democratic transition in Niger once again? I mean, how long is it going to take? Look what's happened elsewhere in the region. The play is hard. Um, Niger will want to play this the way Burkina, Guinea, and Mali has actually played it. And when you look at Mali, you saw that there was a ratification coup again to stay on course. And in Burkina, we had another coup, a counter coup. So they want to play this by their own rules book, dictating the terms that are as earlier stated to us and not by what ECOWAS or any other partners will say. And I also think that Niger have actually weighed their option. They see how important they are to the Western world. They know how they, all, they actually host the drones, the military bases for most of these Western powers. How important they are to Nigeria, for instance. Like 60% of Nigerians live around the Nigerian borders. They are brothers, the same way they are brothers. A people to people relationship with Nigeria, with Burkina, with Mali, which makes it an extremely difficult um, uh, terrain to actually do an interference. Any form of interference put on ground will further impact the insecurity that is actually plaguing uh, many parts of West Africa and the Sahel itself. And it's already a food insecure environment as, uh, as well, with one of the poorest people. It is hosting refugees also from Nigeria, the Boko Haram insurgency. It's like a catch-22, and I'm sure that the Putschists know this. They have this in mind, and it is actually driving what are uh, driving their own response. This is why they can't dictate to us. And we will have to actually find a way to nip it in the board. Because it's not just about diplomacy. This school is quite important because you are talking about 50% out of the eight Francophone countries now under a military regime, which represents a lot of stress for Francophone West Africa and the remaining part of West Africa itself. Yeah, Alexis, I know, I know you wanted to come in there. Four ECOWAS member nations are ruled by self-imposed military leaders right now and are suspended from the body. Two of those countries, Burkina Faso and, uh, and Mali, are supporting the coup in Niger. What are you to make of that? I think that's a product of self-preservation, ultimately, because they know that if they do not show a force of strength and show a united front, then they could be next, because if ECOWAS were to follow through with their threats and to really crack down on Niger, particularly if they did so militarily, then they know that they would be next in the firing line. So that's what I make of that. I don't believe that there is necessarily a genuine united front. And even if there were, I just think that they are all already stretched on their own fronts, because the thing that we haven't touched on is the fact that these countries, what unifies them is the threat they all face from Islamist insurgents. So Mali, Burkina Faso, they're both already stretched militarily in terms of fighting those insurgencies. Um, and so I think ultimately they don't have the resources to really come and present a united front with boots on the ground to support any kind of action. All right. Cameron, um, how long then before a a return to democracy in Niger, if there is a, a transition from military rule, will economic sanctions be enough to, to push this forward rapidly when military paychecks don't get paid? Will the coup leaders be able to retain the support of the rank-and-file uh, military? Well, that's going to be uh, a hard question to answer right now. Um, you know, I think it's it's worth remembering that uh, this coup, even though it was led by the presidential guard, uh, within a matter of hours, the presidential guard was able to to bring on board all the service chiefs from all of the different uh, wings and units of the military. So this is not uh, a junior officer 
uh, you know, coup. This is a senior officer coup. Uh, it has the 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 support of uh, what seems to be the entire armed forces in the country. Um, so, but again, I think the question is, you know, as the sanctions uh, imposed by ECOWAS, as the development assistance that's been cut off from the U.S. and European partners, as that all begins to bite. Uh, and you see, as we heard before, uh, inflation uh, start to rise, uh, electricity rates uh, going uh, lower, um, you know, uh, businesses being affected, people not being able to travel, students not being able to go abroad for classes, you know, these kinds of things that are going to affect uh, you know, everyday people in the country and their pocketbooks and their bank accounts, I think then you're going to start to see you know, perhaps some some pressure on the on the on the on the junta leaders. But again, let's remember the junta leaders have appointed uh, you know an, a, a respected economist to serve as the prime minister. They're hoping that they can circumvent uh, some of the pain of the sanctions by uh, reimposing uh, you know democratic. Uh, you know, ministers in the government to run uh, the government. Uh, they'll be looking for other partners, uh, clearly in Mali and Niger, but also perhaps in Russia and others who they, they, they can continue to trade with. So, again, I think that there is now, uh, given the number of coups that have happened in the region, there are a number of alternatives that countries have been employing uh, to get around the pain of isolation and the pain uh, imposed by sanctions. And I think Niger will, will likely uh, try to follow that same path. Alexis, Russia's Wagner Group is active in the region. Uh, it stands accused of sowing instability and of committing war crimes there. There are reports that uh, Niger's coup leaders have exchanged supportive signals with uh, the Wagner Group. What are the implications of that uh, for the U.S. and the wider region if uh, Wagner is brought into Niger? I mean, I think the implications for the wider region and for the U.S. is that this could be um, not only a loss of the West's closest ally in the region, but then also another staging post for, the, for Russia and for Wagner to just deepen its influence and deepen its roots. We've seen this in a number of countries already. They've been called in in Mali, and Mali have pushed out the French troops. They've pushed out MUNUSMA, the UN peacekeepers. We've seen them in Central African Republic. Um, they've got a presence in Sudan. So, I mean, ultimately, we could see the Russians having access to the drone base that um, the US have there. France also have a base there. Um, and then beyond that, it's just a deepening in terms of the propaganda war and the power and influence that Russia can have in the region. So, I mean, I think that's ultimately what is um, at stake here. Cameron, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that, you know, Russia, the, the role of Russia has been, I think, overstated in this uh, up to this point. I don't think that Russia has the ability to really um, change the course of events or to engineer these events um, in the country. The idea that these Russian flags have appeared at, uh, at the protests in the last week, I think, is more uh, a statement of anti-French sentiment than it is pro-Russian sentiment at this point. I think it's shorthand for anti-France at this point. And so, um, obviously, Russians are great opportunists. Uh, they are going to look at this opportunity now uh, to drive a wedge between Niger and its Western partners and look to exploit that. But but again, Washington, I think, has been very clear this week with the visit of the State Department official uh, that any cooperation with the Wagner Group would be a red line for Washington. And if they hope that uh, they'll be able to maintain, maintain some kind of military partnership with Washington, it can only occur if there is no Wagner in the country. It, it, uh, picking up on, on what Cameron was saying there about anti-French sentiment, with 78 percent of the coups in sub-Saharan Africa since 1990 taking place in francophone states. Is it too simplistic to say that the recent trend of coups in West Africa reflect the legacy of French colonial rule, or, or has each and every coup in these states been driven solely by uh, domestic issues and, and regional insecurity? I think it's a combination. I think regional insecurity is top of on the table. So when you look at the last three other coups, insecurity has come up. Problematic elections is also contributed to this coup d'etat, uh, coup d'etat itself. The failure of democracy to deliver developments to the people in form of public goods and services are there. Then you can then add the anti-Western feeling, anti-French feelings, which in the last couple of years have kind of heightened in this country. And some might believe are also weaponized, yes? 
Toma is to recap their legacy, um, but there are a lot of disinformation also on ground that is actually allowing this uh, to fester, uh, to fester, and to actually gain ma a ground in the hearts of the people. And the question the people often raise all the time is, what is the essence of democracy if it cannot actually deliver? public goods and services to them, or even things that are basic as insecurity, which are part of what these putschists are putting on the table in Niger and making it to look as if it is a good hope. While I will continue to say it is a bad hope, it is one that is actually dangerous, not just for France and West Africa, but for the whole of West Africa, particularly when you look at what geopolitics... Uh, Alexis, perhaps you'd like to, to pick up on, on what Adat was saying there. I mean, Niger has experienced a series of coups since 1974. Is there, is there anything to set this latest one apart from the others, or, or is it part of a pattern? It is part of a pattern, but I think what really sets this apart is just the timing and the fact that um, this was a point in time in which uh, Niger was very much seen as uh, an oasis of calm. I mean, ultimately, I'm going to say oasis of calm. Obviously, they've been going through an insurgency, um, but it's all relative. And in the context of the other dominoes that have fallen in the region, I think that's what sets it apart. I think the other thing that sets it apart is the demographic issue. I mean, ultimately, on many indices, this is one of the world's poorest countries. And right now, there's a point, this point, this inflection point, whereby there are around 24 million people, and that population is expected to pretty much triple by 2050. So, at this point in time, what's different is, before there had been a series of um, coups and there had been unrest, whereas there had been a democratic transition two years ago, the first one of its kind in the country, and there was an opportunity to have accountable governance. It's a very young population, and people do not have a lot of money. So there was a real opportunity at this moment in time for the country to have good health care and better education, a better standard of living. Now, the difficulty that we have now is if you don't have accountable governance, then there isn't necessarily the forward planning that is needed to just turbocharge uh, the development that the country may need. And Cameron, we've, we've got about a minute left. I mean, would you, would you agree with that? How do you see all of this panning out in the, in the days and weeks ahead? I think that, you know, one thing that we're seeing right now is um, a sense that this country is reclaiming its sovereignty. Uh, that word sovereignty has been used a lot uh, in the local press recently uh, and by the junta leaders. Um, and there's a real appeal uh, to public sentiment around this idea of of sovereignty. And so I think that uh, the, the the bloom is going to come off of that relatively quickly as uh, as people realize what they are giving up when they when they take that sovereignty back in that way. Um, the things that that are associated with that, the development assistance, uh, as as Alexis was saying, all of the programs that improve health care, improve security, improve education, improve livelihoods, those are all being put at risk right now. And uh, those are risks that the junta is willing to take. But I'm not sure that over the long term, the population is going to be particularly happy with having uh, that trade off made on their behalf. OK, there we must leave it, I'm afraid. Many thanks indeed uh, for taking part in today's uh, programme. Idad Hassan, Alexis Aquajiram and uh, Cameron Hudson. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. Uh, for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.